So, um, like I said before, we had spoken about the business model. One of the key things for me, the key takeaway is the fact that no business model is written in stone. So if it's not working, don't feel bad to make adjustment. Don't feel bad to change it. And we use God as our um, our model. You know, we've seen transitions, we've seen change. In fact, the book of Hebrews says that if the first covenant didn't have any situation or problem, there wouldn't have been the need for a second uh, covenant, meaning that even the original covenant had portions that needed to be corrected or needed to be updated. Of course, when Jesus came, he said, I did not come to abolish or make away with the uh, law. I came to fulfill it. And so we see an improvement, even though it is not abundant, so to speak, but then we see a constant improvement on the way the kingdom of God operates. And I believe that if Christ is our model, it must be the same with us, that uh, we also keep improving the things God has placed in our hands. And so today, what I want to share with you has to do with the fact that after you have gotten the idea of what you intend to do, you've gotten the concept, you've established the business model, uh, now you want to talk about the business structure, and it is key. A lot of us don't consider the aspect of the business structure so much, and it's the reason why businesses get in trouble, it's the reason why uh, business owners run into all kinds of suits and losses. And so today I want us to consider the various forms of business structure available. Is it a good thing to be a sole proprietor and uh, leave all the exposure of uh, potential legal suits to you personally? Or is it better to, you know, uh, get a shield, so to speak, under the covering of uh, some sort of business entity, whether it's an S Corp, C Corp, B Corp, whether it's, uh, you know, so a uh, partnership or a uh, limited liability company. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the various types of incorporation and why we need to look into that. Some of you at the end of today's class might think of shutting down the type of uh, business incorporation you had and re register a different one, and it's okay if that is necessary to do, to give you the uh, best form of protection and also to, you know, give you the best form of, you know, cutting back on unnecessary on tax or double taxing because there are certain uh, type of business registration that will cause you to pay double taxes. And of course, if it also means maximizing your profit, why not? Or even reducing your personal tax liability. Why not? There are incorporations that allow you to transfer your losses or your profit from the business you operate into your personal tax filing, which gives you a whole lot of benefits. I want us to talk about uh, this morning. So with that said, um, I want us to go right into a few slides that I believe will help all of us. And like I said, I would try for us to get some time for interaction. So if um, there are any questions you have in mind, I want you to write it down, get ready. So when the time comes, you're ready to rock and roll. Write your questions down, you know, go straight to the point and let's address what your concerns might be. So today being the last session of this class, I'm going to be talking about business structure. Again, a lot of people don't wait for the end of the tax season to figure out how their tax situation is going to be. They plan for it. They anticipate. They uh, anticipate their profits. They anticipate their losses. And so they plan how much tax liability. Or better put, they plan how not to pay taxes or what kind of income to show. And so it is key as God's people will become as wise as the serpent and uh, uh, know what is out there in terms of incorporation. So what do we do? I want to give you a few examples. And I needed to do this because we have students from all over the world. And so I felt the need to you know, give a little expose, if you will, of how incorporation is in Europe and possibly somewhere in Africa, if that is where you are. 
Now, in the UK, for instance, there are four standard uh, types of incorporation. And I'm only doing this briefly because uh, this is Legacy Life University is an American school. And so we will predominantly talk more about, you know, how, you know, things are done predominantly in America. But then, of course, we don't want to lose the fact that there are international students here. So assuming you were somewhere in Europe and UK is an example of what pretty much happens in most European countries in terms of incorporation. And the, the, the variations are not that many. The, the principles are pretty much close as uh, you begin to compare what is done in Africa, what is done in Europe, what is done in Asia, and what is done in America. Incorporation is pretty much close in terms of uh, its formation. Of course, there might be differences in the law in terms of the tax law and stuff like that. And, you know, disbursement of profits from your operations, it might vary from country to country. And those are things that you definitely want to seek the advice of professionals like tax experts, uh, CPAs, uh, certified public accountants, and people that are uh, professionals in this area. So again, if you were looking at the UK as a case study, they have four straightforward types of uh, formation of businesses. It's either a public limited company, you'll hear them use the abbreviation PLC, or private company limited by guarantee. And then the third one they have is called private company limited by shares. And the last one is private unlimited company. So it's straightforward in the UK and most of the EU countries, four types of incorporation. Um, LLCs and limited companies that are called LLC, which means limited liability company. And those that are called LTD, you hear companies with the last name LTD at the back of it, uh, which is limited, are guaranteed under state law. But the primary difference is limited pay taxes, whilst LLCs do not. And I'm speaking specifically uh, with the UK and the European countries that you know have similar kind of provision. Now, the abbreviation LTD, like I said before, means limited and is most commonly seen within the European Union and afford owners the same protection as an LLC. Again, when you use the word LLC or you, you form a business or corporation that is called LLC or limited liability company, it simply means that your liability as the owner of the corporation or as a shareholder of that business is limited to the assets of that uh, entity. It means that if somebody ever came against you or sued you or sued the company, they could not come for your personal home. They could not come after your personal cars, your personal investment, your money seated in the bank is all protected because your liability is limited to that company. And so they could not go beyond that. Reason why you got to protect uh, yourself, if you are into any kind of business activity that has a lot of uh, liable exposure, you want to make sure you incorporate separating your personal assets from the assets of the business or the organization. So should you, you know, have a situation that uh, calls for somebody coming after you, you are protected so that all the things you have built, all the wealth you have created over you know, whatever time is not exposed to all these liabilities. One of the many reasons why you want to incorporate uh, the kind of business you are thinking of, or if you already have, and you are you know, um, doing this business as a sole proprietor, which puts the burden of liability on you personally. And I'm going to go into the distinction between a sole proprietor business limited liability corporations and all that. If you're a sole proprietor, all the exposure is on you. So if you've been doing that up until now and you realize that the kind of business you do has a high risk in terms of liability, you would definitely want to consider, uh, you know, scaling from a sole proprietor into having some kind of corporation that gives you leverage in terms of liability. So with that said, let's take a sample of and I'm not trying to be biased because I'm from Ghana, but you know, uh, 
Ghana's model is pretty much similar to what goes on in most West African countries. As I looked at, and even going into East Africa and South Africa, they pretty much they have the same kind of model. They have sole proprietor, they have partnership, they have corporations or external companies, they have limited liability uh, companies, they have unlimited by liability, and they have limited by shares and unlimited by shares. These are the models of most African countries. So in case you're thinking of uh, pitching your business somewhere in the uh, African region, uh, they, these are your options out there for those of us that are thinking of investing. Or if you're already in Ghana, or you're somewhere in Nigeria, Senegal, or Sierra Leone, and you're thinking of incorporating what you are doing, these are the options that are <clears throat> available to you. All right, with that said, let's talk briefly about the need to understand the business structure. The business structure you choose influences everything from day-to-day -day operations. And I don't want to be technical with this aspect of our studies. I want to make it as simple as possible so that we can all understand the kind of structure you choose would influence everything from day-to-day -day operations to your taxes that you are going to be obligated to pay and how much of your personal assets are going to be exposed to risk. You should choose a business structure that gives you the right balance of legal protection and also benefit. You've heard so many times people say, uh, Donald Trump is a billionaire, but he doesn't pay any taxes. It is because of the kind of business structure he chose. You could choose a business structure that at the end of the day, you are left with zero liability when it comes to taxes. And you would have that without breaking any law. You're doing all the right things and uh, doing the right transactions, doing the right incorporation, you'll be left with zero tax liability. And we will get into that in a moment. I mean, sometimes I get frustrated when I hear people saying that uh, the poor people are the ones paying taxes and the rich are paying nothing. It is because of the way they choose to invest. And you can choose to invest in that same way and avoid all kinds of taxes. There are places you could put your money and defer taxes. There are places you could put your money and walk away from taxes completely. There are even parts of your regular salary or income that are uh, tax exempt. If you were investing it into some specific areas of investment, uh, you are allowed a portion of your income pre-tax to put them into investments. We will not get into that today, but these are you know, uh, provisions out there in our tax law that if we know about it, uh, a bunch of the salary you get every week that is taxed so much, you get angry when you see your paycheck, you could actually take a chunk of it and dump it into an investment pre-tax and reduce your tax liability. So again, talking about the business structure. Your business structure affects how much you pay in taxes. I cannot overemphasize that. So don't choose your business structure blindly. You may end up paying so much in taxes if you don't understand the kind of business structure you are choosing. Your ability to raise money can also be affected by that. The paperwork you need to file can also get complicated based on the kind of business structure you choose. And your personal liability could be a challenge if you don't choose the right. Um, I, I mean, you'll be amazed to know that if uh, anybody took you to court, the first thing uh, the lawyers are going to ask is that this person you want to sue, does he have property? Does he own cars? Does he have shares? Does he have IRA? Does he have a 401k? They actually could run your financial background to find out how feasible it is for them to come after you. Lawyers have access to that. And a good number of us don't realize that they don't come against you. They don't come after you blindly. They run your background financially to see how much or how many properties are in your name, how much money is sitting in the bank in your name, how much of investment you have. They want to make sure that you are sueable before they come for you. Of course, they're not going to come you know, uh, put a legal suit against a man that is homeless on the street because you feel like suing them. You could get the suit against that person and never get a dollar from that settlement. So, of course, lawyers will run your background, make sure there is enough to come after. 
Now, you will need to choose a business structure before you register your business. And that is key. That is why a good number of us might even consider closing down what we have and re-register if we chose the wrong type of incorporation uh, with a state registration that we did. Now, most businesses will also need to get a tax ID number and file for the appropriate licenses and uh, permits for what we do. Now, you want to choose carefully while uh, you may consider converting to a different type of business structure. In the future, there, there may be uh, restrictions based on your location, where you are located as a business. And of course, you can be located in New York and incorporate your business in Delaware. You've see, you've had people talk about incorporating. Recently, a guy actually went out of business. This guy that was into uh, Forex operation, is it FTX or whatever? Uh, this guy, you know, his business was registered in the Caribbeans. You know, when the investigation started, I was laughing because I realized that the guy wasn't even incorporated in America. He was a, an offshore company that was incorporated, I believe, in the Bahamas or somewhere in the Caribbean. And he was, I mean, he was breaking it. He was making a big time in America. He had key investors in America, but it was an offshore company. And in that same way, you could incorporate wherever you want. You know, one of the most expensive part of incorporating LLC is the portion of um, advertising. Uh, you are required to advertise your incorporation. And sometimes people don't realize that if you incorporated in Manhattan, you might spend close to $2,000 just trying to publish your incorporations. Well, you could do it upstate New York in a little village and uh, later on, after you've gone through the publication, transfer to the city and avoid all the expenses in publishing your incorporated entity in the city. And you could even incorporate wherever you are and just register locally where you are. Uh, and, and you could have an incorporated Delaware company doing business in New York. So when you get to New York, you just register as a Delaware company doing business in New York. So your incorporation is not necessarily uh, in New York, but then of course you are registered in New York as a, a Delaware company that is doing business in New York. All right, with that said, uh, I also wanna mention that it is key that you don't just take this and run with it, consult business counselors, consult lawyers, attorneys and accountants and uh, make sure you have what works for the kind of business model you are thinking of engaging in. Now, I want to start off with the first one, which is easy to start. A good number of us start from that place, your little operation out of your kitchen, out of your garage, out of your apartment. I, I started, you know, many years ago, myself and my family, we started a spice packaging business. We were living in a two-bedroom apartment, and that's where we started from. And so I understand sometimes we start from those little places and that is good. Now, if you are producing food, you must understand that there are allergens. People are allergic to a whole lot of things. And even the way you package, the kind of disclosure you put on your product is key. It causes you to walk away from a lot of liability. And even beyond that, people would always find a loophole to to see you. So if you started on a small scale and you were a sole proprietor and now you're getting into local stores and this business is scaling, you must begin to think about your protection because people are going to come against you if there is uh, uh, any form of, you know, uh, outbreak, salmonella, uh, um, um, what do you call it? All these food uh, kind of uh, poisoning can happen, you know, uh, even big corporations get it. So you want to make sure you protect yourself. But a good place to start is what we call sole proprietor. Sole proprietorship is easy to form and it gives you complete control of your business. Now you are automatically considered to be a sole proprietorship if you do business activity, but don't register as any other kind of business. It means you are not even required to register anything. You could just begin your operation and automatically you become a sole proprietor. Now, sole proprietorship do not produce a separate business entity. It means the risk is all on you because you are the business. This means your business assets and liabilities are not separate from your personal assets. 
and liabilities. It's key to understand that part. You can be held personally liable for the debts and obligations of the business. So proprietorship are still able to get a trade name. It can also be hard to raise money because you can't sell stocks uh, and you don't have a bank account in the name of anything. It's just in your name. And banks are hesitant to lend to sole proprietorship. So again, if you are considering expanding, getting business loans and all that, you must understand that sole proprietorship could be limiting. Now, sole proprietorship can be a good choice for a low-risk business. Um, you know, who if you are just trying to test your, your services, you are trying to test your product, it could be a great place to start from before forming a more formal business. Now, with that said, I want us to move into the next level called partnership. Now, partnership are the simplest structure for two or more people to own a business. So you and your friend, it could be you and your husband, you and the kids, whatever the case may be. There are two common kinds of partnership, limited partnership. You, sometimes you see the name LP behind the name. You might see that with a legal firm. You might see that with a professional firm. Uh, it is limited partnership and limited liability partnership, which is the LLP. Limited partnership have only one general partner with unlimited liability. And all other partners have limited liability. That is the distinction. Now, now the partners with limited liability also tend to have limited control over the company, which is documented in a partnership agreement. Now, this is where we need to also understand that profits are passed through to personal tax returns. It means if the uh, partnership made any profit, you could bring it on to your 1040s when you file your personal taxes. So you could bring your W-2s, you could bring your 1099 income, and you could also bring the income or the profit you made from your partnership with that friend or that uh, family member in that business of pressure. You could pass it on as an income to your personal taxes. So profits are passed through the personal tax return and the general partner. The partner without limited liability must also pay self-employment taxes. So it's just like having a 1099. The income you're making from that partnership, you treat it as uh, a self-employment taxes. And self-employment taxes simply means that you're going to be paying two taxes. You are self-employed. It means tax number one, they're going to charge you. You're going to pay tax as a business owner. Now, if you are a W-2 employee, there are two taxes that you pay out of your income. A good number of us are not aware of that. The one that hired you and pays you pays taxes on the amount of your salary. And there is a portion that is also deducted from your income, which you pay. So every paycheck you get, your employer pays tax and your, you as an employee also pays tax. So in this same way, anytime you get a 1099, there are two taxes you, you pay. You are paying as the employer and you are paying as the employee. So two taxes, you got to bear that in mind. It's double taxing right there. Now, limited liability partnership are similar, similar to limited partnership, but give you limited liability to every owner. That is a good thing you get. An LLP, a limited liability partner, protects each partner from debts against the partnership. So if the, the partnership incurred any debt, you as an LLP, they cannot come against you or come uh, pursue you personally. They won't be responsible for the actions of other partners. If another partner messed up, it's not on me, even though I'm a partner because I'm in an LLP limited liability company. It's all about liability in, in, in all these types of incorporation. You want to make sure you have a shield, you have a protection against every form of liability. You know, you could have a, a partner becoming negligent. You don't want to bear that cost. You want to make sure it's on that person. Now, partnership can be a good choice for businesses with multiple owners. Professional groups like attorneys and groups who want to test their business idea before forming a formal business. Now, I want to give you a few scriptures that will help you because we are Christians to start with. 
In case you're thinking of entering into a business partnership of some sort, a few scriptures that will help you make that decision. I've always said that there is nothing the Bible doesn't have something to say about. The Bible speaks to every situation. You could find scripture for everything you're going through. So in the book of Deuteronomy 22, verse 10, God gives a principle about partnership, and he's speaking to a country called Israel who are predominantly into agro-business. They were into agriculture. And look at what God tells them. He says, thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Now, we know what it means to yoke two animals. You put them, you see the picture on the screen, they are held by the neck. And what holds them is called the yoke. And God, in principle, is saying that don't yoke two animals who look together, who look the same. Uh, when you look at them visibly. Because when you look at an ox and an ass, on the outward, they look exactly the same. The only distinction between the two animals is their bone formation. Um, Bible makes very clear what a bone symbolizes. It symbolizes your spirit. Because when God met um, the prophet Ezekiel, he took him to the valley of bones and he said, will this spirit live again? Referring to the bones of dead men. And so, the distinction between the two animals yoked together for an activity is in their spirit. Translation, don't enter into partnership with somebody who don't have the same conviction with you. I'm not trying to say that you cannot enter into business partnership uh, with an unbeliever. What I'm trying to say is that you must enter into business partnership with a believer. <laughs> I'm sure I got your attention. So let me repeat myself. I'm not trying to say you cannot enter into business with an unbeliever or partnership with an unbeliever. What I'm trying to say is that enter into business partnership with a believer. Now you're like, what is he saying? I'm trying to say that enter into business partnership with somebody who believes in your idea. And I'm not just talking about a Christian because you could have a Christian who don't believe in your idea. You can have an unbeliever who believes in your idea. You want somebody going to the same place with you. Somebody that have the same belief when it comes to business, not religion. Now the Bible says in Amos 3 verse 3, how can two work together except they be agreed? And of course, Bible makes very clear, Sister Janina, you so right. Bible makes very clear in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness? And what com communion has light with darkness? <clears throat> what concord had Christ with Belial? And what part had uh, a believer with an infidel. And so again, you want to make sure that that partnership you are entering, you are fully persuaded and convicted in your heart. I tell you, you could enter into partnership with a believer and be frustrated and have all kinds of confusion. So just entering into business partnership with somebody because you go to church with that brother or that sister because you are all Christians, it's not a guarantee that that partnership is going to be a success. There has to be agreement in the place of the business, not only in the place of spirituality, even in the business concepts, there has to be an agreement. You want to save uh, yourself the aggravation of getting into uh, business with somebody that can't see eye to eye with you. Bible says that you are better to live in the roof than to live in the same house with a nagging wife. Now, you know, when it comes to husband and wife, it's partnership. The Bible says if you have a nagging wife, you are better off living in the roof. And Bible actually says that living with a nagging wife is like a rainy day. When you hear the drop of the rain on the roof, you just can't go to sleep. And that is what a partnership that is uh, not, a, you know, seeing eyeball to eyeball could potentially end up becoming. All right, enough of that. Let's move on. The next type of incorporation you could have in America is LLC. One of my favorite. Limited liability company. An LLC lets you take advantage of the benefits of both the corporation and partnership business structures. 
It's, it's a beautiful concept. LLCs protect you from personal liability in most instances. Your personal assets like your vehicle, your house, your savings account won't be at risk in case your LLC faces bankruptcy or lawsuit. Profits and losses can get passed through to your personal income without facing corporate taxes. However, members of an LLC are considered self-employed and must pay self-employment taxes, contributions towards Medicare and Social Security. Now, LLCs can have a limited life in many states. It means that in some states, LLC can expire. You need to re-register. Some, some uh, states do have it as perpetual. When a member joins or leaves an LLC again in some states, uh, you may be required to close down that LLC and reform. Some states, if a partner leaves, he leaves, and then, you know, it continues. They could sell their portion of investment to any of the partner, or they can read this best, depending on the kind of uh, states you find yourself. Now, LLCs can be a good choice for medium or high, higher risk business owners with significant personal assets they want to get protected and owners who want to pay a lower tax rate than they would with a corporation donald trump and many other uh, real estate investors take advantage of this and this is what i would even tell people that are into real estate investment or all kinds of business ventures now if you are into a motor a motor um, kind of real estate investment, what I tell people is that you could pretty much have an LLC incorporated for every motor family business you own. What that simply means is that if I have a 10 apartment complex, I want to register an LLC for that. If I bought a second uh, 15 apartment complex, I want to register a separate uh, LLC for that. Why would I want to do that? The reason is very simple. If the tenant in the 10 um, apartment complex slipped, broke his spine and became disabled and came after me with a suit, and that apartment of 10 uh, apartment is worth $5 million, that tenant can sue me and his suit is limited to that $5 million. He cannot come for that other uh, 15 apartment complex because that is a separate LLC. He, uh, that that tenant is limited in how much he can come against me. He cannot come for that. In that same way, that tenant in the other complex cannot come for that asset over here. So you protect yourself along the way as you go. It might cost you a little bit of money to incorporate several LLC. I tell you, that you see all these big guys around, they have hundreds of LLC. And the reason is because they want to limit how much uh, people can come against. You ask yourself, how come these people uh, file for bankruptcy 20 times and they remain, they remain solvent in business? Because the media make you believe they declare bankruptcy, but what they don't tell you is that they declare bankruptcy in one of their LLC. They don't tell you that. So you think the whole empire was bankrupt. No, they were not. It was just one of the uh, LLC. They declared bankruptcy and they kept moving on because maybe somebody came against them with a $10 million suit. They say, you know, well, let's shut this operation down and let's keep going with the other ones. And they do that. The next thing I want to talk about is called C-Corp or C-Corporation. A corporation sometimes called a C-Corp is a legal entity that's separate from its owners. Corporations can make a profit, be taxed, and can be held legally liable. Corporations offer the strongest protection to its owners. Pay attention to that. They offer the strongest protection to its owners from personal liability. But the cost to form a corporation is higher than all than other structures. Corporations also require more extensive record keeping. You can't take things for granted. Unlike sole proprietor, Partnership LLC corporations pay tax, pay income tax on their profits. So if I have an LLC and I take all this rental income from my tenants and I deduct all my expenses, the plowing expenses, 
the mowing expenses, the plumber that came to fix the uh the 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 boiler and all that. I deduct that and I am left with five thousand dollars. I don't pay taxes on it at the corporation level. I transfer that five thousand onto my personal taxes because it is considered as personal income, and that is where I pay taxes. Now with corporation, you are going to pay taxes on that five thousand dollars, and whatever is left, you transfer it if you will to your personal taxes. And again, you pay income taxes on it. So think about it. You get in the highest form of protection, but you pay more taxes. So unlike sole proprietorship, partnership, LLC corporation pay income taxes on their profits. And in some cases, corporate profits are taxed twice. First, when a company makes a profit, and again, when dividends, because the profit that is being transferred to you is no longer called profit, it's called dividend. I guess they have to give it a different name, name so that they can charge you again. So they charge you a second time for what they call dividend. The profit suddenly becomes a dividend when it is transferred to you personally as a shareholder in that business. Now, corporations have a completely independent life separate from its owners or shareholder. If a shareholder leaves the company or sells his or her shares, the C Corp can continue doing business relatively undisturbed. Remember I said in some states, if a partner left an LLC, you may be required to close down that entity and reincorporate. In a corporation, a C Corp specifically, if a partner left, it doesn't affect the business in any way. They continue with their operations as they have been. Now, corporations have an advantage when it comes to raising capital because they can raise funds through the sale of stocks. So we're talking about a corporation that has stocks. What money you put in as a shareholder is referred to as stocks. They are not stocks because they are listed on the stock market, but that is how they are called, which can also be a benefit in attracting uh, employees. Of course, if I want to uh, I'm a professional. I want to work in a company. Uh, I, I want to work in a high-end company that has uh, good profit-making potential. And so, you know, professionals will want to work in those kind of environment. Corporations can be a good choice for medium or high-risk business. Uh, those that need to raise money and business that plan to go public or eventually be sold. You want to make sure it's a corporation. Again, we have the S Corp, which is a little bit different from the C Corp. Now, an S Corp, sometimes um, we must understand that it's a type of corporation that's designed to avoid the double taxation we just spoke about um, in the case of the C Corp. So the S Corp allows profits and some losses to be passed through directly to owners personal income taxes. That's a big difference. Now, if I'm transitioning from an LLC and I'm a small, medium-sized company, I wouldn't jump straight away to C Corp. I would go for an S Corp. The reason being that I'm able to transfer my losses and I'm able to transfer a portion of my profit. What that means is that if I made a loss, let's assume I made a loss of $50,000 this year on my operation. And this is where a good number of the big people are able to get away with taxes. So let's assume all my other business made me make a million dollars. And I have two businesses that give me uh, $300,000 $300, in losses. I'm not going to pay taxes on $1 million. I'm going to pay taxes on $1 million less than $300,000 loss I made. So I'm going to end up paying taxes on $700,000. Make it more simple. I work somewhere, I make $120,000 a year. I have a business that made a loss of $50,000. I can transfer that loss to my personal taxes. So even though where I work, the business pre-deducted taxes out of my income based off $120,000, I can now on April 15th, bring 50,000 losses to reduce my tax liability. So now instead of paying taxes on 120,000, which shows on my W-2 as the income I made this year, I will now be paying 70,000 because I made 50,000 losses on my business operation. So what that means is that the 50,000 loss will be deducted from the 120,000 that shows on my W-2 or my income statement 
and all the taxes my company deducted, Uncle Sam has to refund it to me because my liability has moved from 120,000 to 70,000. I hope that is simple enough to understand. Now, some of these corporations even allows you to spread your losses. What that means is that uh, if I made uh, 200,000 and my income was 120,000, they don't expect me to wipe 120,000 and lose the 80,000. It means I can take a portion of it this year. Uh, in some states, they would even allow you to spread that loss over five years. So if the loss is not enough, and you'll be amazed to know how much of losses these folks declare. And they declare these losses sometimes not because it's so real. They put their travel expense, they put their holiday, make it look like business expense, wipe all kinds of expenses and end up with a bottom line of losses to bring it back to wipe potential income. So they are left with almost nothing to pay taxes. And again, there are loopholes in the law that allows you to spread some of these losses over several years as you go along. And so that is the distinction between S-Corp and C-Corp. S-Corp, you are allowed to bring this income to your personal taxes and uh, get the tax benefit that it comes with. So S-Corp must file uh, with the IRS to get S-Corp status, a different process from registering uh, with state. Every state might, might have their own requirement and there are special limits on S-Corp. Uh, and I want you to check the IRS website for eligibility requirements. You know, I don't want to, you know, put everything here. We don't have enough time to go through that. You will still have to follow the strict filing and operational process of a C-Corp. Now, the S-Corp also have an independent life, just like the C-Corp. If a shareholder leaves the company or sells his or her shares, the S-Corp can continue doing business relatively on the step, just like the C-Corp. S-Corp can be a good choice for a business that would otherwise be a C-Corp, but meets the criteria to file as an S-Corp. Again, I want to move on to a B-Corp, which is not too common. Uh, a benefit corporation, sometimes called a B Corp, is a for-profit corporation recognized by a majority of U.S. states. Now, B Corps are different from C Corps in purpose, accountability, and transparency, but aren't different in how they are taxed. The taxes are pretty much the same. Now, B Corps are driven by both mission and profit. Shareholders hold the company accountable to produce... Um, some sort of public benefits in addition to a financial profit. So you get a distinction. They are not 100% out there just to make profit, but they have something in their mission and in their operation that benefits, you know, uh, people in a community um, in addition to making financial profit. Some states require B-Corps to submit annual benefit reports that demonstrate their contributions to the public good. There are several third-party B Corp certification services, but none are required for a company to be legally considered a B Corp in a state where the legal status is available. Now, I want to talk about closed corporation. And again, all these corporations are not too common because it's not an area that a lot of people get into. Now, closed corporation resemble the B Corps, but have a less traditional corporate structure. These shared many formalities that typically govern corporations and apply to smaller companies. The state rules again vary, but shares are usually barred from public trading. Again, closed corporations can be run by a small group of shareholders without a board of directors. This is the key point that I believe will get the attention of most of you because I know there are pastors here, there are ministers who are into uh, this type of activity, not-for-profit corporation. Now, not-for-profit corporations are organized to do charity, education, religious activity, literary, or scientific work. Because their work benefits the public, non-profits can receive tax exemption status, meaning they don't pay state or federal income taxes on any profit. Well, they don't even call it profit. It's called surplus. Oh, um, you know, uh, extra. 
if you will. So again, uh, I want to pause here and even talk about something that is done in the UK. If you had a not-for-profit organization registered in the UK, for instance, the government matches your donations. It means if people were donating to your organization that is a not-for-profit, the government has a budget that donates and matches these givings that you receive, which is a good uh, way of contributing. It means the government partners with you to do whatever you are doing in terms of uh, being um, an organization that benefits the public. Now, not-for-profits must file with the IRS to get tax exemption, a different process from registering with the uh, process. So this is more of a federal thing uh, rather than a local thing. You must register with a federal government, which is the IRS, to get a not-for-profit exempt status. Nonprofit corporations need to follow organizational rules very similar to a regular c corp. They also need to follow special rules about what they do with the profits they earn. For example, they can't distribute profits to members of political campaigns. You've had people misuse campaign donations and gotten in trouble. It's the same like churches, ministries, and organizations that are not for profit. You cannot just dip your hands into the coffers of the organization and spend anyhow you want. There are guidelines. So non-profits are often called 501c3. And all these terms, C-Corp, S-Corp, somebody will ask, what is the meaning of the S? What is the meaning of the C? What is the meaning of the B? What is the meaning of the, of the 501C3? All these alphabets, numbers, and all these things you are seeing is just the chapter in the IRS laws where these provisions are covered. So when you go to a chapter in the IRS law on taxes, chapter that is called 501c3, that is where you see all the provisions made for 501c. So I know you might have that in your mind. What is the meaning of all this alphabet? They just reflect the chapters. A reference to the section of the Internal Revenue Code that is most commonly used to grant tax exemption. That is the meaning of the 501c3. I want to talk briefly about cooperatives. If you have a co-op, you know, the buildings that are called co-op, they are incorporated as a cooperative organization. A cooperative is a business organization owned by and operated for the benefit of those using its services. Profits and earnings generated by the cooperative are distributed among the members, also known as user owners. Typically, an elected board of directors and officers run this cooperative, whilst regular members have voting power to control the direction of the cooperative. Members can become part of the cooperative by purchasing shares, uh, though the amount of shares they hold does not affect the weight of their vote. Now, I'll give you two quick examples. I've seen insurance cooperative organization. I've seen even electric power cooperative organization. So uh, there is a place in uh, New Jersey, uh, not New Jersey, uh, Port Jervis, a group of homeowners in that area have formed a cooperative you know, it goes along the line of uh, Pennsylvania. They buy electricity in bulk and, you know, use them. So because they buy electric in bulk, all the homeowners came together. They formed this cooperative and they buy electric very cheap because they buy it in bulk and they sell it to themselves. So that becomes a corporation. They buy the electric and then they sell. Uh, there is also an insurance company that forms an, a, a cooperative. I work in a restaurant industry, and we have that. We have an um, an insurance company. Uh, they call it an umbrella group. They form this uh, restaurant association. We all come together. We buy insurance. We share our risk together. So at the end of the year, if there weren't too many claims, what happens is that we end up with profit. And guess what? They return portions of this uh, profit to all the restaurant owners. And I've seen some of the restaurants get even up to $10,000 in refund because their cooperative made so much profit from the operation. So again, uh, if you're engaged in similar business with so many people, you can come together and form a corporate. And if there are profits, uh, it becomes the benefit of its uh, members, it, depending on the kind of uh, uh, agreement you have as members or shareholders of this corporate. Now, it is time for you to register your business name. And I'm going to end with this. Our time is up, I know. 
Having gone through all this eight-week session, one of the things you want to make sure you do if you are ready to hit a ground running and get off the ground, if that is what you're intending to do, you want to make sure you register your name. Register your business name to protect it because before you know, somebody would have taken that name. You would want to choose a name that reflects your brand, your identity, and doesn't clash with the type of goods and services you offer. Once you settle on a name you like, you need to protect it. There are four different ways to register your business name. Each way of registering your name uh, serves a different purpose in some way, and some may be legally required depending on your business structure and location. And so these four things you must have in mind. Entity name protects you at a state level. Trademark protects you at a federal level. If what you have requires a trademark, you want to do that, and it protects you at a federal level. It means the whole country. Doing business as, you see the abbreviation DBA. Somebody has a parent name or, you know, uh, the name of the company, and then they have a DBA, doing business as. Doesn't give legal protection, but it might be legally required. The main name, one of the things you want to do is to also, protect that name with a domain name. You want to buy a space in the virtual world. So you want to make sure your name, your domain name of the business website is also registered. And again, each of these names registrations are legally independent. Most small businesses try to use the same name for each kind of registration, but you are not normally required to do so. Again, you want to consider if the type of business you are doing requires you to have license and permit, consider doing that now if you are thinking of taking off. Most small businesses need a combination of license and permits from both federal and state agencies. The requirements and fees vary based on your business activity, location, and government rules. So you want to research into that and make sure you're ready to go. You will need to get a federal license or permit if your business activities are regulated by a federal agency. Check to see if any of your business activities are listed here. And then check with the right federal agency to see how to apply. You want to look into all that. Due diligence is all I'm trying to project to you this morning. Requirements and fees depend on your business activity and the agency issuing the license or permit. It's best to check with the issuing agency for details on the business license cost as well. Again, I want to talk about federal and state tax ID. Depend on the type of business you are doing. I started off with sole proprietor. You may start off not needing any of these things, but if you are scaling, then you may need a tax ID. And with that said, even if you are being a sole proprietor, you can decide to apply for a tax ID. And again, I needed to understand that it doesn't cost anything. People don't know that they could go online and register for a tax ID themselves. They don't need anybody to do it. You could go out there and do it yourself. It is also called the EIN number, employer or employee identification number. You could get it yourself and it costs $0 to do that. So don't be af afraid to apply for it. Um, again, if what you've been doing up until now, you realize that you were not in the right place in terms of the way you did it, the type of incorporation, there is nothing wrong with you shutting it down and reopening your activity and applying for a new EIN, EIN number if that is what you choose to do. Well, if you have been able to secure your name, you have a tax ID, the next thing you might think of is to open a business account that is totally different from your personal account. You want to be able to track all your income and expense on the business level. And it is key for all forms of activity, whether in future you're thinking of getting a loan for expansion, or even if you have an audit being performed by the IRS, you want to make sure that your your private uh, activities are not commingled with your business activities. So open a business account. And of course, you can't open a business account without having a business registered and having uh, a form of business 
uh, incorporated and also having a tax ID. Those are the two basic requirements a bank is going to need to open a bank account for you. And of course, why do I need to get a bank account? These are key things you must understand. There are benefits for having a business bank account. Most business bank accounts offer perks that don't come with a standard personal bank account. Number one is protection. Do you realize that the FDIC gives you up to $250,000 in protection if somebody ever got your bank account number and did any fictitious transaction in your account, the bank was required to pay you back up to $250,000. Well, if you had that mixed up with your personal account, uh, both your business and your personal liability was covered up to $250,000. But if you split it, had a separate account for your personal activities and one for the business, you instantly had a coverage of half a million dollars, 250 on the personal and 250 on the business. So the protection is key. You want to make sure you have a separate account for the business. Number two is professionalism. Down the road, you're going to ask for a loan. Don't you realize that the bank will want to see how you have performed? They want to see banking records over the last two years. And if you've not had one, how are you going to prove yourself? Customers will be able to pay you with credit cards, make checks out to your business instead of to you directly. Plus, you will be able to authorize employees to handle day-to-day -day banking tasks on your, on your behalf for the business. And preparedness, like I said, Prepare for tomorrow. It might come in handy when you need to show your financial activity. And again, purchasing power is one of the reasons why you got to keep a business account. Credit card accounts can help you, uh, can help your business make large startup purchases and help establish a credit history for your business. And you can do that when you have opened a business account. A bank will be willing to give your business a credit card. I could go on and on, but time will not allow me. I had a summary of the incorporation of what we spoke about, and I will put this on our page so that you can get understanding of what a distinction of the different types of business structures look like. I want to truly thank you for your participation in this class. It's been quite a lot of information. There are even a lot more I would love to give, but again, I'm always open if anybody has any question, even outside of this class, please feel free to contact me, whether by text, phone call, or even email. And I would always be available to answer your questions.